That first Easter Sunday was eventful to say the least. Some women early that morning encountered the empty tomb and angels and the risen Lord himself. Then late that afternoon, two men on the road to Emmaus encountered the risen Jesus. What would happen that evening? The day's not over. Join us. Get your Bible. Let's talk about it. The disciples had walked with Jesus for three years, but in the last week of Jesus' life, his followers were close friends and they were there and they were all watching and observing and involved in what was going on. They experienced Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And as he approached the city, he wept over it. The original language says that he sobbed. So he's going into Jerusalem for the crucifixion and he went on into the city and into the temple and cleansed it. And scripture says that he then taught daily in the temple during that last week of his life and he preached the gospel. It was Passover week, so Jerusalem was crowded. And Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room where they shared the Passover meal, or what we now call the Lord's Supper. There was Jesus' arrest and all the trials and the scourging and the crucifixion on that Friday. Then early Sunday morning, some women went to Jesus' tomb and found it empty. There they encountered angels and then the risen Lord himself. The women ran to tell the disciples. Jesus had sent word through an angel to them for them to meet him in Jerusalem, in Galilee. And Jesus himself greeted the women and said, Do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they shall see me. Late that afternoon, Jesus appeared to two followers on the road to Emmaus. And Luke tells us that after their encounter with Jesus, they went to Jerusalem and found gathered together a group of people in that place. So turn with me to Luke chapter 24, the gospel of Luke chapter 24, and let's read the account. I'll begin in verse 33. And they, that would be the two guys that were on the road to Emmaus, arose that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them, saying, The Lord has really risen and has appeared to Simon. And they began to relate their experiences on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of bread. And while they were telling these things, He himself stood in their midst, but they were startled and frightened and thought they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet that it is I myself? Touch me and see for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still could not believe it for joy and were marveling, he said to them, "Um, have y'all got anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. Now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses in the Old Testament and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day and that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. 
and you are witnesses of all these things. John tells us that they had gathered in this room for fear of the Jews. They could, uh, they concluded that if the Jews had killed Jesus, then they'd soon be after them because they were followers of Jesus. And so there they are huddled together in this room that some believe was the same upper room where they had had the Passover meal. The doors were latched. It truly says in the original language, they were barred. And so the windows were fastened down. And so they're gathered there hiding, trying to sort everything out. Can you imagine what all these people have gone through just in the past week? They had heard the testimony of the women that the tomb was empty and the angel had explained that Jesus had risen. Mary Magdalene and the other women told them that they had seen Jesus and he was alive, but they didn't believe it. Luke makes sure that we understand that everybody told the same story. Get that in your mind. All of these people who had different experiences all told the same thing. That is very important because if you're trying to verify something, it is very strong evidence when everybody tells the same thing, when they all saw the same thing. So here were eyewitnesses. There were the women, the Roman soldiers. That's interesting because that was the only explanation they had had. They were put there to guard and that's all they could figure out was that he had arisen. Then you have the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, all isolated instances, but the same story. Now look with me in verse 33 there in Luke 24, and let me show you something. It says, and they arose that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them. Now, one thing we need to understand here is that the phrase, the 11, becomes a technical term for the apostles who were different from disciples. A disciple, the word disciple means learner, follower. So Jesus had lots of disciples, lots of followers, lots of learners, and they were everywhere, women, men, all kinds, but the apostles were a special group. They were sent ones. They were set apart. They were commissioned. Now, you'll remember that originally there were 12, but Judas is no longer with them. He's the one who denied the Lord and left the group and ultimately in there somewhere went out and hanged himself. Well, even here, it says the 11, but 11 of them are not there because Thomas is not there. Scripture tells us that in this first appearance, Thomas is not there. We don't know why. We don't know where he was, but they are still called the 11, even though right then there were 10 of the apostles. They're called the 11 because that's just kind of a reference to the apostles. And you're going to see things like that as you read on through the New Testament, knowing that it's not literally 11 apostles sitting there. It's just their name. It's how they're categorized. It's what they're called at that time. So verse 33 says, there were 11 and those who were with them. And he doesn't specify who else was there. So get the picture of your in your mind of this group of people gathered in this room. It's dark. The doors are barred. The windows are fastened down and they are huddled up and they're listening for any sound because they're afraid. They're so full of fear. Cleopas and the other guy on the road to Emmaus are coming up. And so they're probably banging on the door and the ones inside are like, who in the world is that going to be? And so Cleopas, they say, come on in, let us in. It's us. We've got something to tell you. And so they're begging for these folks to let them in. Well, look in verse 34, because this is interesting. Cleopas and his buddy think they're going to give them some great news, some good news. But in verse 34, they already knew it. 
And so when Cleopas and his buddy come in, they say, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Simon. Simon Peter has seen him. So they kind of were beginning to know that something was going on, even though they were not yet really, really believing. And so given that, they all just go on to relate their set of circumstances. Sometime during that first Easter Sunday, the Lord appeared to Simon Peter. That's all we know. We're going to talk about that in another lesson. But sometime Jesus appeared to Simon Peter. This is the only time in the four Gospels that we're told about the Lord's appearance to Peter. Um, we're just not given much inf information about it. It is fascinating to speculate, but that's all it is, a speculation. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 refers to the fact that he appeared to Cephas, or, or that was another name for Peter. And so that's all we know, was that sometime on that first day, with all that's going on, the whim, and them running to tell the disciples, and Peter and John running to the tomb and finding it empty and then just going back home and all of these things are happening. Well, somewhere we don't know what time of day Jesus appeared to Peter. Knowing Peter's failures, my heart is stirred by the mercy and the love and the personal attention of the Lord to Peter. What kind of conversation must it have been? What do you think Peter said to Jesus? And what would Jesus have said to Peter? What was on Peter's mind? He was so, he had so messed up. He had denied knowing Jesus and he ran and he hid and he was the leader of the group. So you've got to know that whatever Peter is doing here, whatever his attitude is, whatever his behavior is, the other people are kind of taking that as an example. They're accustomed to following. And so they're probably going to kind of keep on doing that. And right now, Peter's not really believing. He wasn't really believing. And how heartbroken he must have been. You ever had those things in your life that, you know, you just really messed up and you've even had a hard time forgiving yourself? Maybe you had expectations of yourself that were too high, like Peter when Jesus told him, he said, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter says, uh-uh, not me. I'm not doing that. But he did. And so Peter's getting to know himself. He's getting to know his own failures. He's getting to know all of those things that, that he needs the Lord for, but the Lord is teaching him even in the midst of all of his failures, of his sadness, of his grief, of his conviction of sin. And so Jesus had told him back in Luke 22, Jesus had said to Peter, Satan desires to have you. Satan desires to sift you like wheat. And I've given him permission to do that. Why would Jesus do that? What are they doing? Jesus is building an apostle, a disciple, a preacher that's going to wind up being the one of one of the greatest preachers that the world has ever known. So hang with him, and we're going to look at that. But probably Peter's unbelief and his behavior had this huge influence on how the other apostles are believing and behaving. Because if Peter doesn't believe it yet, then maybe these, maybe they need to question whether they believe it or not, because they're getting all of these reports. But now, in this place, when they're gathered in the room this time, at some time before that gathering, Peter had seen the risen Lord, and he had told the apostles. What do you do? We're not told. Maybe he said, hey, ladies, you were right. You know, I should have believed you when you told me. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 5 simply says that he, that is Jesus, appeared to Peter and then to, this calls it, the 12. The 12. But again, same thing. We know that it's not literally the 12 because they're not 12 anymore. Well, look down there in verse 36. 
And while they were telling these things, he himself stood in their midst. He himself stood in their midst. Can you imagine what that's like? Dark room, locked up as soundly as you can get it, hiding out, being quiet, and all of a sudden in their midst was Jesus. Second time this has happened. First time, Thomas wasn't there, you know, or, or you know, or this, this is the first time. So, so here they are, I'm getting my lessons mixed up here. But here they are. And so John said that when he appeared, he just said, peace be with you. Peace be to you. And they were shocked. They didn't know what to do. I think some of them, most of them probably had not seen Jesus yet. They didn't know what the resurrected body of Jesus looked like. They didn't know what it was like to encounter a resurrected body. The women had, Peter had, what about the rest of them? So they're just there, but Jesus spoke to them. And look beginning in verse 38, what Jesus said to them. And Jesus said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still could not believe it for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and ate it before them. And they're probably gawking because one of the things this tells us, and we're going to do a lesson on it later, the resurrection body could eat. The glorified body could eat. So Jesus is teaching something here about a resurrection body. And he says, you got anything to eat? And they say, yeah. And they give him a piece of raw fish and he ate it and they watched him. Verse 44. Now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Now let that thought sink in because over and over again, we see the value of the word of God, the importance and the value of what we have in this book. There are some people that will tell you, mm, the Old Testament doesn't mean anything. Well, Jesus taught it. He didn't think that. It's what they knew and it's the blueprint of all that was to come. And so I just love it when it says here, you know, all of the things that were written about me and the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, all of those things have to be fulfilled. The Old Testament blueprint was fulfilled in the person of Jesus. So he's explaining that to them. It is so hard for us because we've had a New Testament for so long we maybe don't even quite know how to think about that. But having this New Testament shows us the fulfillment of all that came in the person of Jesus 2,000 years ago for us. And what a value we have in having this whole composite truth so that we can grasp it and understand it. So he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He still does that for us today, even though now the, the scriptures include the books of the New Testament. And he said to them, thus it was written, it is written, that Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day. Where is it written? Old Testament. And that repentance for forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from... Jerusalem. Where are they? They're in Jerusalem. He says, you are witnesses of these things. And so Jesus is saying what? 
And I think this is something we need to understand here because I think Scripture is saying the same thing to us. You know what he's saying to them? Guys, think. Think. Think about it. Use your minds. Look at the evidence. Here's the evidence. You've had eyewitnesses. Use your eyes. Touch me. Look at this. Feel it. Touch me. Turn with me there to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verses 24 and 25. Now here's John's account of this first appearance of Jesus to the disciples in this room. But Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus, that's interesting because that means twin. So scholars tell us that Thomas had a twin brother. We don't know anything about it, but Didymus means twin. And so Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore were telling Thomas, we've seen the Lord. And he said, unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, put my hand into his side, I'm not believing. I'm not believing you. Now go back to Luke chapter 24 and look at verse 39. I love this. This is so important. Jesus said, see my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. I myself. Literally, he says, look at my hands and my feet, see that it is I am. I am. Do you remember that phrase? Remember the Old Testament when God named himself and he said, you know, Moses, he said to Moses, Moses said, well, who am I going to say sent me? And God said, you just tell them I am sent you. And so here comes Jesus. This is important because over and over, now we begin to see that Jesus is God. He's God in the flesh. Somebody was asking me um, a couple of weeks ago, how do you explain the Trinity? What, what do you do? And, and, and they said, people use ice, steam, and water. That's really kind of a good illustration because they're all H2O, but it's frozen H2O, gaseous H2O, and liquid H2O. But it's all H2O. What is it? It's different forms, three different forms of the same thing. That's a simple, good way, I think, to explain the Trinity. God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. All the same thing, all God, three different forms, three different jobs, three different reasons for each member of the Trinity to exist, even though we may not understand all of those reasons. But if you think of steam, and ice and liquid, you need those three different things for different reasons. If you want to cool a drink, you're going, not going to use steam. And the liquid may just not be cool enough to start with. So what are you going to do? You're going to use ice. Same thing. If ice melts in a glass of water, what you still got? Water. And so Jesus, we're beginning to, they're beginning to put things together here. We need to put this together, that Jesus is God. And I just love this. This gives my cold chills, cold chills. To know that Jesus looked at them and said, see my hands and my feet, that it is I. It is I am. You know, over and over in John's gospel, he uses that phrase as he declares the deity of Christ. That's one of the, the characteristics of John's gospel and one of the things he does so much. But over and over, the great I am statements are in the gospel of John. And so if you look at them, you're going to see uh, things like um, where Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. I am the door. 
I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the vine. I am. Why? Because Jesus was God in the flesh. So when we look at Jesus in the ministry, the sacrifice, in the resurrection, I'm sorry, in this crucifixion, and then in the resurrection, what we're saying is God died for our sin. Jesus, God, died for our sin. I am is the name of God. And so what's happening, there's so much in this set of circumstances for the disciples to see and grasp and understand. And so, oh my goodness, you know, all of the days that they've walked with him, they've seen him heal the sick, they've seen him raise the dead, they've heard him preach the gospel, they've asked him how to pray, They've had all of these encounters with him, and there's just so much that I can understand from, for me, how that first they just didn't get it all. And so it's going to take them some time to just figure it all out. And that's what they've been sitting here in this room doing, is trying to put together all of the things that they knew, all of the things that they had been taught and what they had seen, and that there are some now who believe, some who are still going, uh, I don't know about this. And so I just am so grateful that Jesus is available to do whatever he needs to do to alleviate our doubts. And so as he alleviates their doubts, he's also teaching. He's also saying, realize, understand that I am God. I'm God. I am, I am. And so what Jesus is saying here is use your senses. Use the information that you have. Use your brain. Look at the evidence. They had tons of it. They had eyewitnesses. And so Jesus is, is trying to explain to them, guys, just look at it. Just look at it. Just look at it. Think about it. Think about what you saw. Think about what these trustworthy eyewitnesses have seen. Think about it. And then begin to apply it to your life. Let it dawn on you. Let Jesus reveal himself to you, and he will do that. So he says, look at it. Think. Use your brain. And so slowly, 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 it's dawning on the disciples that this is true, that he truly is the risen Christ, that he is the same Christ that walked the earth with them, that taught them, that stayed with them, that befriended them, that encountered them. Not only the apostles who were there, but the disciples They've just got to be sitting there with their mouths hanging open and trying to process all of this just as fast as they could, just, just to figure it out. There was so, so much. And so here they are, and it's slowly dawning on them what the Old Testament said about Jesus, that Jesus was who he said he was, that he died for their sins, so that they could be saved. They were beginning to slowly grasp, Jesus is God. The question is, has it dawned on you? Has it dawned on you? Use your minds, use your senses, use the Word of God and ask Him to reveal Himself.